Welcome back to Slumber IV. In today's video, we are going to be all over the place. In the best way possible, though. We will be kicking things off with a terrifying story about the Wendigo. Then we will be moving on to a story of a cult gathering in the woods. And last but not least, a story that'll have you scratching the back of your head. But not for the reason you think. As always, if you enjoy a particular story, you can find the author's links in the description. I would like to give a huge thank you to all of them for allowing me to share their frightening tales with all of you. I would also like to break out of character for a moment and say thank you all for the recent support. Even if I can't make money off of these videos, I love the small community we have. Being a voice on the internet is a lot of fun, and I know I've said that before. And I'm also very grateful that so many of you enjoy what I do. I know I can't post as often as I did before, but I'm grateful to have an audience that understands and sticks by me. You guys really are the best. But enough with the sappy crap. You guys are here for the stories, right? So I hope you enjoy. And as always, I hope you all have a great night. Story 1 The Time I Saw a Wendigo by I Merciless Void. First things first, this happened to me when I was around 10. I've lived in Idaho all my life and spent a lot of time outside or in the wilderness as a kid. My grandparents would take me camping and my older brother and I would always hike up whatever trails we could find to get a view of the sunset. On one of these occasions, something terrifying happened. We were up at a campsite I only know as Warm River. The river there never freezes over and my brother and I were on a regular evening hike. There was an old tunnel bored through the mountain at one point of the trail, probably an old train tunnel, and we were walking through it when I heard something I'll never forget. After walking through probably two-thirds of the way through the tunnel, I heard a terrible screech at the end we entered through. The screech wasn't like anything I've heard before. I've heard the screams of animals on dark and windy nights, I even think I've heard Bigfoot calls a few times. But never the metallic, grinding screech I heard that day. The point is, whatever the sound was, it did not sound natural in any capacity. I probably jumped five feet in the air when I heard it, and my brother shouted a few choice curses before shooing me quickly to the exit of the tunnel. At this point, my brother decided we should just continue walking and head back after whatever made the noise hopefully cleared out. We didn't have any firearms on us, so I was pretty upset. My brother reassured me we would be fine, and we made the walk back without incident. However, I didn't get any sleep that night. Whatever was the thing that screeched at us, or just my imagination, I heard things moving around the campsite the whole night, as well as whispers echoing through the darkness outside the trailer. I woke my brother up a few times to check out what it was but he refused each time, telling me that it was probably just other campers staying up late and enjoying themselves. The rest of the trip was pretty normal. We packed up the following day and life continued as normal. I was disconcerted, but shocked what happened up is a harmless event that I must have been exaggerating in retrospect. A few weeks later I went up to Pine Basin, an old ski lodge my family rented each year for family reunions. Here I would mess around with my cousins, our favorite activities being night games. We would play hide and seek, a game called Ghost in the Graveyard, and other games like that. On one instance, I was chosen to be the seeker for a hide and seek game. Because I was one of the younger cousins, I got a flashlight as an advantage. Normally all the younger cousins hid close to the lodge, and the older cousins hid in the nearby trees or at the base of the nearby mountain. As I was searching near the bottom of the mountain, I heard a familiar whistle up the mountain a bit. We would always whistle as a hint at our locations. It sounded like someone was hiding way up near a tree known as the Underwear Tree. You can guess why. So I began trekking up towards the whistle. As I climbed closer, I got an uneasy feeling in my stomach. I continued on wearily, and convinced myself that I would be fine. I hated walking in the night alone. 
but figured whoever I found would walk with me back to the lodge. As I neared the tree, I noticed that it was deathly silent. This alerted me that something was very wrong, because you could always hear the adults having fun back at the lodge. I was anxious to hurry back, so I called out. I found you, Scott. I thought the whistle was my older cousin's. Come back down to me. I got no reply, but I wasn't planning on waiting. As I began walking back down the path, I heard a voice call. You almost had me. So I ran back up to investigate. I flashed my light in the branches of the tree and saw a monstrosity that was not my cousin. It looked like a poorly drawn stick figure made into a human, with its emaciated figure and lifeless eyes. I remember its face looked like the skin on its head was being pulled from behind. It had torn and stretched features. As soon as I saw the creature, I screamed, dropped the flashlight, and ran back to the lodge. The entire time I ran, I was overcome by an overpowering smell, and I could hear the thing running after me. As I approached the camp, I saw a few people, my cousins, at the bottom of the mountain waiting for me. I was crying and shaking and they took me inside. I told my dad what happened, but my cousins all said they didn't see anything following me. The adults kept us inside for the night, and I kept hearing sounds drifting in from the mountains. I never played night games again after that, and was always terrified that my cousins wouldn't listen to my warnings. Ever since that night, I have always felt uneasy up in those mountains. I used to be really religious and figured it was a demon of some kind trying to kill me or something like that, but those mountains have never felt the same after that incident. A few years ago the game Until Dawn became really popular, and I watched a walkthrough of it on YouTube. When the Wendigo first appeared in game I got chills down my spine. It was exactly what I saw, and I did a ton of research on them. I figure someone must have gotten snowed in at that old lodge, and resorted to cannibalism, but that doesn't explain what happened at Warm River. I still hear that screech from time to time. It never occurred to me until watching Until Dawn that they might be from the same thing, and it scares the hell out of me every time. I heard it earlier tonight, and that's why I decided to finally write my story down. Wish me luck. Story 2, A Cult in the Woods by Sparks92 In the middle of the woods, there is a cabin that I often visit. I don't know how long it's been there or who built it, but for some reason, I feel at home when I'm there. The signs of aging are visible all over the walls, which tells me that it's been standing here in the middle of nowhere for an extended period of time. There are pictures left behind from the previous visitors, but none of them are of people. Each one of the photos is of locations in the surrounding woods, and I don't know why, but when I look at them, they send chills through my body. I have an uneasy feeling whenever I'm at the cabin, but no matter what, I keep coming back there no matter how eerie I feel. During one of the first visits, I found a bunch of twigs tied together. It was like something straight out of the Blair Witch Project that made me think that something dark happened here. I kept searching the house for more clues of what the cabin was used for, but all my attempts of solving the mystery always ended in failure. One day when I arrived back at the cabin it felt like something was out of place. It took me a minute to figure out what it was, but then it was all too obvious. The wooden floor was stained with blood, not dried up dark blood. The blood on the floor was fresh and still looked wet. Everything else in the cabin seemed to be in place, and there were no signs of anyone around, and if it hadn't been for the blood, you would say I was the last one there. Everything inside me told me to get out of there, and to let someone know what I found, but curiosity always gets the best of me. I told myself that it was some elaborate prank, and that the blood was fake, that someone knew I was visiting the cabin frequently, and wanted to scare me away from there for whatever reason. I decided that it was time to figure out who was using the cabin whenever I wasn't there. I left for the day, but before I did I left a few rocks near doorways that would be moved if someone other than me visited the cabin. 
The following day when I returned the rocks that were placed by the door openings were no longer by the doors. They were in the center of the floor stacked in a pile that kind of resembled a human figure. I have to admit it was pretty creepy, but it still wasn't enough to scare me away. I was still determined to figure out what was happening here. I placed a few GoPro cameras around in the cabin discreetly so that no one could find them. I set them up to record and then left the cabin once more. I waited around outside a few feet away from the cabin hiding in a tree line in hopes that someone would appear. I waited for an extended period of time until I was satisfied that no one was coming. I was kind of disappointed. I was hoping to catch someone red-handed. I headed back home. When I got back to the cabin a day later all my GoPros were gone except for one they missed. I was pretty angry that someone took off with them because they weren't cheap to buy. And one of them actually belonged to my brother so I knew he would be mad at me. I just hoped that whatever was on the last GoPro would be worth losing the other ones over. I got home that evening and uploaded the footage to my computer immediately. When I pressed play I wasn't prepared for what I was about to see. A figure walks into the cabin. I can't tell if it's a man or woman, or even human because they are wearing a dark robe of some sort. Maybe it was a cloak. The figure walks around the room and picks up each one of the GoPros and then hands them off to another figure that was out of camera view. Once the figure thought all the cameras were gone, they proceeded to light the candles around the room. The candles were all lit, and then a few more cloaked figures appear on my screen. And then they part to let a figure in a red cloak into the center of them. My GoPro must have crapped out because either they weren't talking or the microphone never picked them up. They stand there and appear to be talking for a bit. Then another figure comes into the center of the circle. Only this one isn't wearing any cloaks. In fact, she was tied up. This is where I realized that the sound wasn't broken because the silence was interrupted by the girl pleading and screaming. She was telling them to let her go, and that she wouldn't tell anyone. The figure in the red cloak walked towards her and stabbed her in the stomach. The other cloaked figures began chanting something, but I couldn't tell what language they were speaking. Then I closed my laptop screen and I immediately felt sick to my stomach. I didn't know if what I just watched was real or not, but either way, it was messed up and disturbing. Whoever those people were, they intended for me to find that video. They didn't miss that GoPro. They wanted for me to find it. I decided I would sleep on it before I made my mind up what to do. A part of me wanted to go to the police and show them what I found, but the curious part of me told me to leave it alone for now and that it was probably a sick prank. It was the dead of night, and I awoke because I had the sudden urge to use the washroom. I reached my hand out to turn on the lights on my bedside table. My room was pitch black so I felt around aimlessly for the switch, but I couldn't find it. When my eyesight started to adjust to the dark room, I realized it wasn't my room. I was in the cabin. I stayed still and listened to see if I was alone, and then I realized I was not. I could hear someone breathing heavily from the far corner of the room, and as I looked in the direction of the sound, I could faintly see someone in the corner wearing a red cloak. I pretended to not notice them standing there, and I stood up slowly. I had to think long and hard about my next move, because it could be the difference between life and death. I could see that the door in the room was open, so I made a run for it. When I got out into the main section of the cabin, I could see there were other people also in the cabin. They were all wearing dark, colored cloaks. I knew they had to be the figures from the video. The figure in the red cloak emerged from the door behind me. I was now caught in between them with nowhere to go. I knew it would be pointless to fight back, so I just stood there helplessly. The figure in red was now a few feet from me, and then suddenly stopped. I was now at the center of the circle, and I knew how bad things were about to get for me. Inside I was losing my shit, but outside I had to maintain my composure. I was having flashbacks of images from the video, of that girl laying helplessly in her own blood. The group standing around me started chanting something in another language, and just like in the video the figure in red entered the circle holding a knife and walked towards me. 
He was inches away from me, and the chanting got louder and louder. I wasn't sure what was going on, but whatever it was, I wanted no part of it. The figure was now standing face to face with me, and I was waiting for whoever it was to make a move. The knife was now visible, and I was ready for it to move towards me, and when it finally did, I grabbed the person's hand with all my might. We struggled for a moment until I finally got the knife free from their hand. I held it towards the circle and they all took a step back. I took this opportunity to make my way towards the door without turning my back to any of them. I felt around for the door handle and when I found it I pulled the door open with force and ran outside the cabin. The night was dark and I couldn't see a hand before me. I looked over my shoulder to see if there was anyone chasing me. And as I did, I seen the figure in red emerge from the cabin and begin running towards me. I continued running in the opposite direction, tripping over stumps. I didn't know where I was going, but all I cared about was getting the hell away from the cabin. I fought my way through the thick branches with them scratching at my face. I was growing tired and I knew I had to find somewhere to hide. I found a small hole that must have been dug into the side of the riverbank by an animal. I started to dig at it to make it bigger for myself to crawl inside. I kept digging like a dog trying to find a bone. I managed to crawl inside the hole and then I covered myself with the loose dirt that was on the ground. I stayed in the hole in complete silence, listening for any sign of movement. I could hear branches cracking around me and then splashing in the river. Then everything grew silent. I remained there waiting until I felt safe, but in all honesty, I wanted to stay in that hole forever. I felt safe, like a baby in a womb. A few hours passed and daylight began to break through the trees. It was a welcoming sight to see, and somehow in broad daylight, I felt safe enough to crawl out from the hole. I looked around and the coast was clear. It was now or never. In daylight, I could tell I was only a few miles from the highway, so I ran as fast as I could, and I never stopped until I could see traffic. When I got to the road, I managed to get the attention of an elderly woman, who was driving a Ford Focus. She rolled down her window and asked what I was doing in the middle of nowhere. I told her I was being chased and I needed help. The lady hesitated for a minute, but she finally unlocked the door and told me to get in. When I was finally sitting in the passenger seats, I let out a breath of relief. I started to cry uncontrollably, thinking about how close I just came to death. She drove a few miles until we reached a gas station on the side of the road. I got out of the car and thanked the lady who gave me a slight smile and drove away. I ran inside and yelled at the cashier to call for help. The worker hesitated for a minute, but after looking at me, they picked up the phone and called the police. The cashier poured me a cup of coffee and brought me into the back room, and told me to stay there until the cops came. When the police showed up, I told them what happened, right down to every detail. I told them about finding the blood on the floor and setting up the GoPros. The officer was upset that I never notified them from the start, and told me that things could have ended badly for me. They asked me to take them to the cabin so that they could see for themselves. We began our walk through the woods, and as we were nearing the cabin we could smell and see smoke coming from the clearing. When we finally made it to the location there was nothing there. Where there once stood a cabin was now just burnt debris. Whoever was using the cabin must have got spooked and burnt all existence to the ground. The police now became suspicious of me and my story and figured I made it all up. I told them I have the tape at home to prove it, and I would give it to them when we got back to town. I should have known it wouldn't be that easy. The SD card that was in my computer was no longer there. I knew I had left it there, but I guess whoever kidnapped me from my home that night must have taken the evidence. Whoever I was dealing with were far from amateurs. The police did tell me though that they had several reports similar to mine in the area over the last few years but they contributed all the missing persons to runaways. Several of the locals though that I spoke to from the area days later told me that there is a lot of cult activity in the area 
and that I was lucky to be alive. A few weeks later, I moved from that house to another rental across town. Since the cult knew where I lived, I was paranoid that they would come back and finish what they started. I stay away from that part of town now, and I no longer go wandering into the woods. I've been watching the news religiously since that day, in hopes that I find a story similar to mine, in hopes that someone out there has a similar experience as mine. Story 3 There's a Bump on the Back of Your Head by Mr. Michael Squid Reach your left hand behind your head now. Touch the back of your head on the right side near the base of your skull using your ring finger. Do you feel a bump there? If so, I need you to listen very carefully. If not, it still might not be too late. I found one too, just a few days ago. I'd woken early and zipped through the morning routine but a phone call caused me to turn my neck a bit too quickly as I was shaving. I ran to answer, expecting news about the merger we were working on. I lifted the cell phone from my desk and answered with my right hand, then touched the aching kink in my neck with my left. I felt a bump and withdrew my hand in shock as I listened to my boss. Three more emails and a last minute revision. It would be an extra hour of work and I sighed then touched the bump on the back of my head again. I would never felt it before. I washed myself off and raced to the computer, revising the emails and sending the new itinerary to my coworkers. I grabbed a cereal bar from my cupboard and glanced longingly at the coffee maker, knowing very well I'd be struggling until at least lunch. My glance was redirected to the tight schedule planner in my head as I locked the house and unlocked my car. I started the engine and drove, practicing my rehearsed speech a few times. A nagging feeling of unease kept tugging my attention to the rear view. I kept looking for the bump I had felt just above my hairline behind my ear, seeing none. I reached back with my right hand, but it was gone. I felt nothing, and chalked it up to the pain of perhaps whiplash from the phone's ring, having stretching the ligaments in my neck. I'd survived the day at least, so I placed my thoughts of my well-being on the back burner. I had a merger to assist with. The day was exhausting but fruitful, and I couldn't wait to celebrate. The rest of the week would be a cakewalk. Still, it was overshadowed by thoughts of a malignant tumor. My father had passed from brain cancer, so I was rightfully worried. I gritted my teeth and made an appointment first thing the next day via speakerphone on my drive back home. I kept looking in the mirror, but there was no sign of any abnormality. I replayed the events of the morning and then touched the back of my neck with my left hand, and I let out an involuntary yelp. Something big and soft was just under the skin, poking from above my neck. It was definitely there, larger now and filled with smaller, squishy parts. It was the length of a fingertip and twice as wide. Was it a cyst? I began hyperventilating. I got off the nearest exit, winding down the spiral into a barren intersection. The sky was dark and the lighting low, so I pulled over next to a bodega and turned the interior light on in the car, peering into the mirror. There was no sign of anything there. I finally took my phone out and snapped a few photos from the flash getting an odd stare from the occasional passerby. Well aware I looked like a lunatic. Nothing. Each photo was the same. A smooth, clean, blank canvas of skin. There was no sign of any lump. I sat there for another ten minutes, feeling it with the soft tips of my ring and pinky finger, wondering how only those fingers seemed to feel it now. It was like a strange trick of the mind, like when you put a warm and cold object in the same hand, and it feels like you're holding something burning. That was surely it. Just an odd, sensory illusion. I finally drove home, but I spent the evening searching for answers. I looked in the mirror for nearly an hour, experimenting with the anomaly. I looked online through various message boards, even asked some friends via messenger and text, but no helpful answers were to be found. I even posted an anonymous inquiry to a number of forums, 
hoping for some sign I wasn't absolutely insane. I found a number of unsettling image results, and a few nightmare tales of discovered terminal cancer, which did little to ease my growing anxiety. After a long shower, deliberately not washing my head, I distracted myself with some television until it was late. I eventually unwound and was able to fall asleep. I woke up and started my routine again, showering, shaving, flossing, and brushing. I checked my emails and ate a proper breakfast before I touched the back of my head with my right hand, feeling nothing. I then remembered the strange phenomena and touched back there behind the right ear with my left pointer finger. Nothing. I sighed out with relief. It was gone. Just a stress-related fluke, perhaps. But then my ring finger brushed against something and I felt it. Something was definitely there. Something that seemed to contain bones. Something that seemed to move. I yelled and pulled my hand away, quaking with horror. I'd felt it. Slick and shifting, jutting out from the back of my head. Yet I could only feel it with the ring finger of my left hand. It was much larger. Alive and serpentine. Like a small fleshy eel filled with tiny ribs and warm organs. I screamed and cried, confused and terrified. I emailed work, explaining I needed the day off. I made an emergency appointment and drove to the physician's medical complex, unable to stop shaking. There was something alive in my head, protruding from the skull. I felt nauseated and tried to count the fibers in the carpet of the waiting room to keep from vomiting as I waited. Finally, the salt and pepper hair, thick rimmed glasses, and practiced smile of the doctor welcomed me into his office. So what brings you in today? Was answered by my recounting of events, how I felt something on the back of my head, something moving. He pulled out a light and took a look and probed the skin of my neck and skull. He then asked me to locate it, and I did to his response. Hmm, there's nothing there. I'm happy to inform you. Have you been stressed out lately? He asked. Yeah, but that's not what this is, I explained. If there's something wrong with my nervous system, I need to know. I read your family history. I understand your concern. But there's absolutely nothing there. Maybe take a vacation. Your job sounds very demanding. He smiled relaxed. I listened to his attempts to reassure me. He prescribed an anti-anxiety medication and sent me on my way. Call me in a week if the sensation persists. I shuffled my feet to the car and sat inside, touching that horrible thing on my neck that just one of my fingers on just one of my hands seemed to feel. I was going mad, or maybe I was having a nervous breakdown. Stress, like the doc said. Maybe a cancerous tumor had crossed some wiring in there, and I felt it outside for some reason. Either way, I had to know. And not in a week, I had to know right then. I drove straight to a craft store, walking past aisles of balsa wood and glue sticks. I bought the box of X-Acto blades. After returning home, I laid them on new towels after boiling them one by one to sterilize them. I then tried breathing exercises to steady my shaking hands. I moved a standing mirror into my bathroom to view the smooth back of my blemish-free hand that looked perfectly normal, and I felt back there. Only the tip of my ring finger could feel it, but it was definitely there. A large moving bump that pulsed and writhed, slippery and soft and alive. I watched my hands in the mirror. Steady and pale as they operated, I watched as the blade cut into air in front of the neck. Just air, but I felt an excruciating, piercing pain. I felt that thing smacking into my ring finger as it writhed and squirmed, and I kept cutting around it near the base. I sat shaking and wide-eyed as the mirror showed nothing but my clean, clear neck, and my fingers held nothing, but I felt it. I felt an agonizing pain and a thrashing thing flailing against one fingertip as I cut from my skull with the razor. 
After 15 agonizing minutes, I stared in absolute horror at the twitching stump jutting out from the back of my head, now glossy and red from blood that was only then visible. I looked at that horrible thing moving upon the bathroom floor for the first time. It was large as a prawn, and unlike anything I would seen, it writhed back and forth on the bloody tiles where it had fallen. It looked like a giant mammalian caterpillar, variegated with translucent flesh over dark veins and vertebrae visible from within. I could even hear it, hissing and spitting angrily from the floor, eager to escape, but instinctively my leather dress shoe stomped down. A squeal howled from the crunch of bone, and thick, red blood pooled out from under my shoe's heel. I trembled and cried, horrified and confused as to what was happening. I stood to fetch some paper towels to clean the mess of gore and dispose of the thing that was inside my head, and I stopped in front of the TV. The female newscaster, pretty and immaculate in her heavy makeup and silken hair, was turned to the other anchor. And there it was, moving around just under her golden curls. A horrible, translucent worm writhed about, twisting and bulging and reaching out as she ranted about Thanksgiving events in the area. The male newscaster turned and I saw one on the back of his dark, parted hair as well. I fell into my recliner stunned, no longer concerned with the blood spilling from the back of my head onto the leather chair as I flipped through channel after channel in shock. Every piece of live footage showed those strange, moving stalks. They coiled and swayed from the base of skulls, wiggling and alive. I watched with a fluttering heart as a model in a fast food commercial ate a burger while a strange and pulsating thing wriggled down onto her neck. I could see the internal organs from the translucent skin darken and flush as she bit into the burger. I slowly stood and then walked over to the window, peering out into the busy streets, and watched as an icy wave of fear washed over me. Every man, woman, and child I see down there has one of those things growing out of their heads. Each stems from the base of their skulls, behind their right ear where the head meets the neck, where I had felt it. Some are larger than others, with more sections. Some with what appear to be tiny nubs of forming legs that poke out of the sides near the end. I have no idea what they are, but they somehow seem able to bypass our senses, and they seem to be growing. Now reach your left hand behind your neck. Touch the back of your head on the right side near the base of your skull using your ring finger. Can you feel it?